Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar co-hosted by the University of Toronto's Centre for Vaccine Preventable Diseases and UNICEF Canada. My name is Shelley Bolitan, and I am the director of the CVPD. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. For those of you who are joining from elsewhere in Canada, I invite you to reflect on and acknowledge the land on which you live and work. Transparency in research is the key to public trust, so we would like to note that the CVPD is supported by the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, which funds infrastructure, faculty, and staff salaries through a mix of operational funding, grant funding, and donor funding, including funds from vaccine manufacturers. We have a robust set of governance processes at the CVPD to ensure that funding sources do not impact the ap academic freedom of our members. Today, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Ephraim Lamengo and Dr. Shannon McDonald with us to provide a first look at UNICEF's latest findings from their 2023 report on immunization, which was released just this morning, and to share insights on the current status of routine immunization coverage in Canada. In the lead up to World Immunization Week, which takes place next week, this webinar will provide a platform to reflect on the current state of immunization coverage and highlight areas for future improvement. But I'd like to formally introduce our speakers. Dr. Ephraim Lamengo is the Associate Director in Chief of Immunization at UNICEF. He oversees the immunization and vaccine related work for UNICEF spanning across six world regions and over 130 countries. He previously worked at the Regional Immunization and Primary Healthcare Focal Point in the WHO's Regional Office for Africa, where he led interventions to strengthen immunization systems and help develop the Regional Immunization Agenda 2030. He has worked on national and international immunization, child health, maternal health, primary health care, and macroeconomic issues for more than 16 years. Dr. Shannon McDonald is an associate professor in the Faculty of Nursing and an adjunct professor at the School of Public Health at the University of Alberta. Prior to pursuing graduate studies in nursing and epidemiology, Dr. McDonald was a pediatric nurse, which was the foundation for her research interest in childhood immunization. Her research focuses on supporting immunization best practices and policies, and she has a particular interest in addressing system level barriers and supports to achieving high immunization coverage in underserved populations. She leads an interdisciplinary research team that works with vaccine policy advisors, program administrators, and clinicians to address real world questions to inform immunization best practice and policy. So a few housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, towards the end of the presentation, uh, there'll be an opportunity to ask some questions. And so after the presenters uh, present their slides, we will open up the chat pod for a Q&A session. So once that happens, feel free to type your questions or comments there. And we will do our absolute best to get to as many questions as we can. And we apologize in advance if we run out of time before every question is answered. You may also direct any questions you have after the webinar to our email address, cvpd.dlsph at utoronto.ca. Lastly, we recognize the value of reasoned discourse, but this commitment comes with the responsibility to ensure respect for others. So please ensure any questions or comments for today's speakers are made respectfully and remain in the spirit of positive academic discussion. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Lamengo. Thank you very much, Shelley, and thank you so much for the opportunity to come back to speak to academics in the uh, University of Toronto, uh, uh, and of course, the opportunity to share the new hot of the press uh, uh, reports, the State of the World Children 2023 report for every child vaccination today uh, with our partners in Canada and beyond. And I'll be very happy to start sharing my slides if it's the right time to do so. Yes, please go ahead. 
Excellent. Can you see my screen? Please confirm. Yep, we can see it. Perfect. Today, I'm here to share with you the key findings and messages of the State of the World Children Report that we just released today, titled For Every Child Vaccination. So the State of the World Children Report is a flagship report of UNICEF, which we publish usually every two years, and it was in publication since the 1980s. It's the first time that we have a sole focus on immunization this year, rightly so because we are facing a significant challenge globally that requires the commitment and action of everyone in the global community. The report covers four important issues. It discusses why vaccines matter, especially to children, to families and communities, but it also addresses the key setback we have seen since 2021 in immunization coverage across countries in different regions and continents, which is the backsliding and the key barriers affecting access to immunization. There is a new data on the determining factors that exposes children to become zero-dose children or to miss on their vaccination or to be under-vaccinated, and also a new data on the state of vaccine confidence based on our research working with the Vaccine Confidence Project. We'll also be discussing a bit about the strategies and opportunities that will help us recover from these setbacks and ensuring every child receives all their essential vaccines in our effort to reach every child. Allow me to start by sharing you a story. And I'm sharing you this story, assuming that this is, assuming that you believe this is a story of millions. And it is indeed a story of millions of children that tend to be exposed to any form of vaccine preventable disease. Disease that we can prevent if we take the right measures, which is simply to have our children vaccinated. This is a story of a young girl called Tolu Alase. And Tolu Alase, she's sitting on a mat in a tenement in Lagos, a little girl. Her forehead and arms are covered with fading scars. A few months earlier, the girl fell ill with high fever and developed a skin rash. Her grandmother, Victoria Aina, who cares for her, was very concerned. I became, what she says, I became worried when she stopped eating her favorite meals. She said, Tolu Alasi loves bread and beverage. I was alarmed when she shunned them. Someone in the neighborhood spotted Tolu Alasi in the street and diagnosed her illness, and it was measles. Treatment followed and the girl recovered. Tolo Alase was lucky. Many other children are not necessarily that lucky. Measles is a killer, often dismissed as just one of those things that children get, a rash and a fever that clears in few days. Measles claims around 351 lives every day, mostly children. And children who catch measles are at risk of pneumonia, and of longer term consequences such as brain damage, deafness, and blindness. Tulao Alase was lucky, truly lucky, but many other children aren't necessarily that lucky. And this is the story of millions. The story of millions is being discussed in this State of the World Children report. And when I tell you of any number, please keep in mind these figures do represent stories, do represent individual lives and faces in each and every part of this book, this, uh, uh, this globe. We live in a world where during 2019, 2020, and 2021, we have missed significant number of children due to disruption caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, and of course, exacerbation of other factors that were pre-existing before even the COVID-19 pandemic hit. UNICEF estimates about 67 million children missed out entirely or partially on routine immunization in this three years period. And out of this, 48 million missed out on all vaccines as we call them zero dose children. And as I stated, this is due to disruptions caused by the pandemic, but of course, other issues related to vaccine hesitance, uh, pre-existing health system challenge and conflict in so many other countries. 
At this very moment, one in five children are zero dose children who remain unvaccinated and who requires our attention to be able to reach them so that we could prevent vaccine preventable diseases. The backsliding in coverage during the pandemic came at the end of a decade that saw little growth. And you can see here a graph which plots what was happening in immunization coverage globally since the 1980s where immunization program called the Expanded Program on Immunization was started. And as you can see, our starting point was quite low in coverage about in the 20s uh, uh, percent in the 1980s, but due to this program, our performance improved significantly in just 10 years period. This is one of the historical achievement of humankind where we have went from just 20% coverage in selected vaccine antigens to 76% in 1990. Albeit a bit slowly, a slower growth was followed, which has helped us to reach about in the 80% of children at some time in 2010. A bit of plateauing following the 2010 coverage rates, Again, a bit of slow growth, but almost plateauing that helped us reach about 86%. The global community came together to find ways of strengthening systems, to find new methods of reaching children in conflict affected settings, in urban poor settings, in remote rural settings, which you find many of these unvaccinated children. Unfortunately, the pandemic hit and now coverage went down, affecting almost 112 countries who have missed on their vaccination coverage and so many children missed on their vaccinations. And the 67 million I spoke earlier is a result of such a decline due to the COVID-19 pandemic and other, uh, uh, other circumstances that occurred during those years. If you look at it from number of children that we call zero dose children or children who have completely missed on any of, on all vaccinations or on all antigens, Back in 2000, we estimated on an annual basis around 22.3 million zero-dose children, which significantly decreased due to a decade-long effort to about 15.4 million, which was a wonderful success, followed by another decade of a bit of stagnation, slower progress, which still decreased the number of zero-dose children to about 13.3 million right before the pandemic, and a significant blip, which is an increase of about 5 million new and vaccinated zero dose children in the years between 2019 and 2020. We can do better. And as most of us know, immunization is one of humanity's most remarkable success stories, not only in just saving uh, children from preventable cause of uh, uh, preventable diseases, but also really contributing to social economic development and gender empowerment. If you look at it from return on investment perspective, Vaccines deliver an unrivaled return on investment, an estimate between if you spent a dollar on vaccines, the likelihood of having $26 in return is quite eminent with life saved, productivity improved, and loss prevented. And in some researches, this can actually extend to a level of $52 return on investment with $1 invested in immunization. But it also protects families from poverty, because it helps to avoid catastrophic payments that come out when, ch when children fall sick due to vaccine preventive diseases. It promotes gender equity. You know, mothers are the primary caregivers. And when children are less sick, once they are vaccinated, it means more time for women and mothers to be able to do their daily uh, uh, chores as they wish to. And improve education outcomes, which is a significant thing that we have seen as coverage improves, children educational outcomes also improves due to avoiding um, sick days in schools. And it also protects wider communities through herd immunity and also reduces antimicrobial resistance as it decreases the use of antibiotics for pneumonia treatment and other diseases. Overall, we know at this very moment, vaccines save about 4.4 million lives every year. And this figure could, could go as high as 5.8 million if we manage to meet the Immunization Agenda 2030 goals that hopes to reach every child everywhere. The story of unvaccinated children, it's very important for us to understand that it's one of underinvestment and inequities. Especially underinvestment in primary health care is one of the critical aspects. If you look at the per capita expenditure on primary health care in different countries of different income level, 
in low income countries, you will see countries spending only $26 per head for primary health care, while this increases to something like $26, uh, $61 in low and middle income, especially lower middle income countries. And this grows a bit to $193 per head in upper middle income countries, and it blips quite high to a level of about $1,333 in high income countries. This is a spectrum of expenditure, and definitely this cannot result in greater coverage, especially in those low income countries who suffer from significant strain on their health systems. Workforce is very critical. As most of you know, the health workforce is predominantly women. But unfortunately, women are not represented in leadership roles in the health sector, and they are not well paid. And a significant number of vaccinators are women community health workers who normally work on stipends, and they are not trained well, they are not supported well, and they are only counted on to serve as volunteers, which is not fair and which will not take us to the last child. 40% of children who are immunized live in conflict-affected settings. This has been the case in the past. It still continues to be the challenge, especially as the number of children who are unvaccinated increases. We have seen, for example, in the Horn of Africa, increasing number of conflicts in the Pacific and Asia, in places like Myanmar, uh, in Afghanistan, and in Ethiopia, and in many other places where there is conflict that affects access for service. Poverty has been a critical determinant, showing us a clear stark difference between a well-to-do and the less-to-do families have different possibilities or different chance of being vaccinated. If you compare the wealthiest with the poorest, you will find in the poorest households, one in five children are zero dose, and in the wealthiest, it's one in 20. It does clearly show you the, the diversity of uh, uh, different countries that are compared in this. And in some places, the difference between the poorest and the wealthiest could go as high as 20 times. If you see Nigeria, if you see Pakistan, children, the likelihood of being zero dose in poorest families is 20 times higher as opposed to the wealthiest families. And in places like Angola and Ethiopia, you will find it to be about 10 times. And in many other countries, between five to 10 times. Women empowerment is a critical determinant. And our assessment clearly shows about 23.5% of children are zero dose among mothers without any education. And this clearly shows you the impact of mother, uh, uh, empowerment of mothers and women empowerment. And there is another measure of women empowerment as well, which is a self-reported women empowerment measure. The more women are empowered, the less likely their children will become zero dose children. And if you compare it, it gets to as high as three times to four times likelihood of being um, a zero dose child if you are born to a mother who is less educated or with no education and less empowered. Ethnicity plays a critical role, especially in, spe especially in a specific segment of population. In many countries, there are specific ethnic groups who do not necessarily favor vaccines or who are not served with the available uh, uh, health system, which tend to be socially excluded that requires our attention if we are to reach the last child. This is an attempt to show you the uh, inequity, the vast inequity that exists in uh, children, especially in poor communities and countries. The inequity improves as the income of countries improve. And as you can see, between low income and upper middle income countries, you see the overall percentage of zero dose children decreasing from 18% to 7.3%. And even the disparity between the wealthiest and the poorest and the urban and rural also varies depending on uh, which low income uh, frame uh, these population are. It is important to recognize that there are deep seated system challenges that need to be addressed. So anything cannot be, I mean, not, not everything can be attributed to the COVID-19 pandemic, but there are also critical systemic limitations that we have to address especially the shortage of healthcare workers. For example, in Africa, we estimate that we need about 3 million community health workers. What we have is 1 million community health workers who are less paid, less remunerated, and require our attention. Limited access to essential supplies, including vaccines and equipment such as refrigerators, limits our ability to provide vaccines to communities. Poor engagement with communities, 
we have seen there is enough evidence to show as communities are better engaged, the likelihood of increasing coverage in immunization is much more likely. And the lack of integration with primary care misses contact with children and families. And this is a critical system design problem we have where so many programs are vertical and disease focused and they do not necessarily invest on health system strengthening. The weak capacity for collecting and using data is also another challenge that we will need to address. It is vital that we invest in primary health care strengthening if we are to reach the last child. So the story of the unvaccinated children is also one of the trust and confidence. Trust and confidence play the key role. And if you see this data, and it's a bit, I'm not sure whether this is visible to everyone, but it clearly shows you this is a data from the vaccine confidence project where we have uh, uh, UNICEF analyzing a specific component of that uh, uh, survey. And we have analyzed the intention or the perception of mothers and families about the importance of vaccines. So we can see here that the sense and the perception of importance of vaccines have decreased in 52 out of 55 countries surveyed. And this is right after the pandemic. This is in 2021. And the comparison is made with the vaccine survey right before the pandemic, which is 2019. In some places, for example, Republic of Care, Korea, and Papua New Guinea, this could go as high as 44 and 46 percent, 48 and 46 percent, and almost all countries are affected except for the three countries, China and in Mexico, where uh, the perception on the importance of childhood vaccination uh, held firm or improved during this time. But the good news is that if you see 40 of these countries, they still have about 70 percent of the surveyed people who actually believe on the importance of vaccines. So that's a good news, but at the same time, a warning sign that we really need to pay um, attention. We know vaccine confidence is a volatile issue that requires um, uh, strict monitoring and follow-up to be able to find ways of engaging with communities. It is a very high time that we catch up on the children that we have missed before it is too late. There is a significant consequence if we fail to do so. And number one, obviously, children's lives will be lost and the worsening impacts in years to come as climate change risk exposing new communities to new diseases and also uh, um, outbreaks increasing in number and the likelihood of drug resistant infections. And in fact, our failure as a global community to be able to meet uh, the children's right to healthcare under the Convention on the Rights of the Child is going to be uh, um, at risk. And of course, our commitment to meet the sustainable development goals will be challenging if we are uh, uh, not able to respond to this current challenge. So the call is we must do more and we must do better and we should do it now. It cannot be tomorrow, it cannot be the day after. And what it takes us to do this is a bit of challenging but doable things. Number one, we have to be able to strengthen primary health care at all levels. And we can start from community health worker which are able to provide the required services at community level. And this required requires us finding ways of engaging communities and empowering communities through these community health workers. We have to be able to spend more, but also spend better for immunization in primary health care, even at times where fiscal situations are quite tight. And this is the time that where we are in a, a very challenging situation. According to World Bank's report, we think the estimate shows that around 41 low and middle income countries are unlikely to get back to their health expenditure level they had before the pandemic until 2027. So asking these countries to invest more is a very hard ask, but it needs to be done considering immunization return on investment, the potential to be able to reach more children. We have to bolster vaccine confidence and it takes us, what it takes us to do uh, uh, and bolster vaccine confidence is our efforts to engage communities, is our effort to do social listening and understanding social dynamics. And it's also our commitment to strengthen health workers' capacity to do interpersonal communication, because nothing can replace the interaction between the health worker and the mother and the child. We need to invest in new approaches, which is going to be a significant undertaking going forward, including vaccine manufacturing in low and middle income countries. It's a time for political will at this very moment, colleagues, 
and nothing will happen without the global, national, and local will to protect children from vaccine preventable diseases. We are asking the global community to stand together to have this will that is grounded in optimism that we are able to do this because we have done it. And the COVID-19, um, our response to the COVID-19 pandemic is a good testament that we can do it. And what we have achieved so far in immunization is also uh, a true demonstration of our ability to be able to reach these children. Reaching the last 20% is always a challenge because we have completed and we have finished all our low hanging fruits. And what it takes us to take, get to the 20%, the last 20%, requires us to decipher some of the systemic challenges. So that is why we are calling now, it's time for determination, political will, and the time for us to protect the health of every child. Thank you very much. I will stop on this. Thank you very much, Dr. Lomango, for this uh, sobering view on the state of immunization globally. Uh, now I'll turn it over to Dr. McDonald so she can present to us uh, her research on the state of vaccine uptake in Canada. Wonderful. Thank you. Can I confirm you can see my slides all right and hear me? Yep. All good. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. Um, so moving from a global perspective to a Canadian perspective, I'm going to talk a bit about improving vaccine uptake in Canada beyond the pandemic and acknowledge that I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So having heard about this global context, the, the status that we're in, um, I'd like to now follow up about talking about the situation in Canada. Um, first, I'll discuss how the pandemic has Im impacted routine immunizations here in Canada, both in terms of impact on coverage, as well as impact on vaccine attitudes. And then I'm going to spend a bit more time discussing some, some strategies um, that we've been using to catch up vaccine coverage and how these might even allow us to exceed the coverage we had pre-pandemic, which wasn't anywhere near where we would have liked it to be. In particular, I'll highlight how some of the strategies we put in place to increase COVID vaccine coverage during the pandemic could really be leveraged to improve routine coverage post-pandemic. For those of you that are attending the Canadian Immunization Conference next week, I'm going to um, highlight a few projects that will be presented there as, as a bit of a teaser, so you can maybe look for those um, presenters at the conference. So in terms of infant vaccine coverage, countries across the world um, have noted drops in coverage, as was just discussed, um, and Canada was no different, though the impact really did vary by jurisdiction. In particular, it's important to note that the impact on infant vaccines really differed based on the process and providers for early childhood vaccines in different contexts. So in provinces where primary care offices are the main site of delivery, as in many parts of urban Ontario, the closure of physicians offices for in-person appointments early in the pandemic brought vaccine delivery to a halt. It's hard to deliver vaccines in a virtual environment. Whereas in a setting where all infant vaccines are delivered in public health centers, Alberta being one of those, infant vaccine delivery just stopped for a few days while public health clinics set up processes for safe vaccine delivery and then opened up again. So I'm referencing three studies here, one in Ontario where they found that immunization coverage for children under two remained below pre-pandemic levels throughout 2020, so slow to increase again. Some data from Quebec that showed that pandemic related closures had the biggest impact on the 18 month visits, but that coverage returned pretty quickly to pre pandemic levels. And in Alberta, we saw that coverage really fluctuated with pandemic closures. And I'm going to share a, a slide particularly about Alberta from work that my team has done. So this is looking at measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, MMR. And the graph shows MMR vaccine coverage at one month past the due date when it's due at 12 months of age. So what you see here is we took the percentage of kids vaccinated in 2020, the year the pandemic started, and subtracted the percent vaccinated in 2019. Uh, when the line is in the green region, it tells us that vaccine coverage was higher in 2020. And when it drops in the red region, it tells us that coverage was lower in 2020. So what you can see here is that coverage fell with the onset of COVID-19 lockdowns in March that you see there um, and dropped about 10% below what they had been before, then rebounded um, shortly thereafter. 
then dropped again in late fall of 2020 as COVID cases started to rise. So really fluctuating with um, the, the impact of the pandemic. This graph only uh, follows uh, these kids till the end of 2020. And so we need to do additional work to see how the um, pandemic continued to impact infant vaccine coverage. School-based delivery is an important area of focus here in Canada. School-based delivery is really the standard approach for delivery of adolescent vaccines. And in normal times, this approach is largely effective aside from sometimes some problematic consent processes. Um, but it's really been effective in improving equity of vaccine access because parents don't need to take time off work and get their kids to a, a public health center or a primary uh, care office. Um, they just send them to school and they can get vaccinated. But of course, in a pandemic, as schools closed in-person delivery, it brought adolescent vaccine delivery to a halt in most parts of Canada. Here in Alberta, we saw significant drops in coverage, particularly of HPV vaccination. Um, the proportion of children who received um, all scheduled doses of HPV was significantly lower during that first pandemic year and didn't recover much during the second uh, pandemic year. Uh, we followed some of these kids over time. So from that first pandemic year cohort, we followed them uh, over time to see how the system was catching these kids up. Okay, so I'll move to the next slide where we can see the impact on school-based coverage in Ontario. So this is from a recent report from Public Health Ontario showing two-dose HPV vaccine coverage at 12 years of age, which is the blue dashed line. And you see it dropping from 60% prior to the pandemic right down to about 5% in the first year and 2% in the second year, and only getting back up to about 15% in the third year. So definitely huge impacts there. And another important study from Quebec where they saw drops in HPV coverage uh, compared to pre-pandemic. So um, the blue is pre-pandemic, the green is um, in 2021-22. And what you see in the left-hand graph is that children who experienced the highest level of material deprivation had the highest drop in vaccine coverage. And in the right-hand graph, we see that those who live in areas with a high proportion of immigrants showed more significant drops in vaccine coverage. So there's definitely some equity issues at, pl at play. So that's vaccine coverage, but we, as, as Dr. Lamango highlighted, we also know that the COVID-19 pandemic had the potential to impact parental perceptions of routine vaccines. So in order to explore this, this was a study our team conducted uh, through two uh, sequential pan-Canadian surveys with the same group of parents. Um, the first survey being in December of 2020, just as the first COVID vaccines were being approved, and the second survey being done in late fall of 2021, when vaccines were readily available for those 12 and up, uh, but not yet for younger, younger kids. And one of the findings we had here is that while the majority of parents said that their perception was unchanged, which is very encouraging, Almost 25% of parents actually reported that they perceive routine childhood immunizations as being more important as a result of COVID-19 pandemic. So these were findings about routine vaccines. Certainly confidence in COVID-19 vaccines is a slightly different story. And we should also be mindful of the fact that this was the fall of 2021 when the second survey was done and certainly changes may have occurred since then, which are reflected, I think, in, in, in the UNICEF report that Dr. Lamango presented. Um, there's some differences between the study that that report is based on versus this that I'm certainly happy to talk about in the question period before because the, the findings look slightly different. So, Talking about the reasons for under immunization, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I really wanted to highlight the fact that, you know, we often talk about things like, you know, the impact of vaccine safety, whether there's confidence in vaccines, whether there's a belief that the diseases are serious, but we really need to remain mindful that parents deal a lot, deal with a lot of barriers that also influence their uptake of vaccines. So for instance, do parents know when the child is due for the vaccines? Is it difficult to make an appointment that accommodates a working parent's schedule? Is the vaccine location easy to get to with, you know, bus service or parking? Are appointments available when uh, working parents need them? Is information available in languages that people are comfortable? And have we appropriately managed pain and anxiety? 
So these are all things that can impact um, and interact with vaccine hesitancy that we need to be mindful of. So moving, moving on to sort of some more solution-based approaches. So the pandemic has certainly highlighted the importance of considering all these barriers. And it's um, certainly provided some motivation by governments and health authorities to implement strategies. You know, we've shown that um, increasing immunization program resilience is needed and investment in infrastructure is needed. So I wanted to highlight a few strategies that have been used to uh, recover uh, routine vaccinations and areas where COVID vaccine programs might have given us some hints on how we could do better. So an important area of innovation that occurred during the pandemic was the focus on improving access, making it easy to get vaccines by meeting people where they're at. So improving access to vaccines might include viewing every connection with healthcare as an opportunity to vaccinate. For example, it's not really a common approach in Canada to deliver vaccines within hospitals, although we did that with COVID vaccination. So it's something we might want to consider doing more of in the future. It also is important to create additional opportunities to be vaccinated. So for COVID-19 vaccines, drive-through and pop-up or mobile clinics were used throughout the country. Um, particularly, you know, Ontario had some great mass catch-up clinics um, for various, for COVID as well as school-based vaccines. So um, adopting those strategies going forward would be really important. COVID resulted in also lots of growth in opportunities to engage digital technologies in optimizing vaccine uptake. So prompts and reminders for parents can be really, uh, really valuable. For instance, in Alberta, after an initial reduction in vaccine service delivery at the start of the pandemic, many public health centers were contacting parents of six-month-old children to remind them that if they didn't get their child's third dose of rotavirus, they were going to age out of the program. And it actually resulted in rotavirus vaccine coverage that was higher than it was pre-pandemic. So those, those prompts are really important. Other sorts of online tools and digital tools like decision-making uh, tools are also critical. And there's an entire session at the Canadian Immunization Conference talking about how these digital innovations could be carried forward. It'll also be critical to reinforce and restore confidence in vaccines. And this could be done through development of really culturally and linguistically appropriate promotion materials. For instance, um, our team is working in partnership with a First Nations community, um, working with them to develop a promotional video um, for pregnant women in the community to encourage vaccination. And that is being presented by a student at Canadian Immunization Conference next week. Um, there's also been uh, an uptick in the use of strategies to support decision making. Um, because of the pandemic, there's been more training opportunities and information for vaccine providers to increase their knowledge and confidence in having those difficult conversations. And there's lots of sessions at CIC coming up about that. To optimize the effectiveness of these programs, the, the strategies really need to be tailored to country specific or even region specific settings, as well as existing healthcare and vaccine delivery systems. So as I mentioned, school based vaccine programs are well established in Canada. And although uh, they were the most impacted by the pandemic, they also offer some of the best opportunities to facilitate uh, uptake of vaccines as we recover. Um, outside of school, the way childhood vaccines are delivered varies across the country. Like I said, some in public health centers, some in primary care settings, and those will all uh, have implications for how these strategies work. So digital reminders may look differently in a public health delivery setting versus in a primary care setting. I think an important thing to consider too is the age of eligibility. For publicly funded vaccines, which varies across Canada, we know we have this patchwork uh, system of, of vaccine schedules, but it has implications for the ability of kids to catch up on miss, missed vaccines. So for some vaccines, it may be necessary for some provinces to expand the eligibility for publicly funded vaccines so that children don't age out of vaccine eligibility before they can catch up. So for instance, in Ontario, they have expanded eligibility for some adolescent vaccines uh, with new age or grade-based eligibility criteria to give kids time to catch up. Whereas in other settings, like in Alberta, where for instance, HPV vaccine, you're eligible till you're 26 years of age, no change is needed in that, in that regard. 
ultimately being able to implement, target, and evaluate these interventions effectively is going to be made a lot more straightforward if we have strong data management systems in place. And these are required for monitoring effectiveness of interventions and identifying high-risk populations that we haven't reached appropriately. For instance, in Alberta, we have a very comprehensive provincial vaccine repository that captures all public and privately funded vaccines that are delivered. It allows researchers like me to evaluate interventions, allows public health practitioners to access records in diverse settings, and allows vaccine program administrators to determine populations that aren't being underserved, that aren't being served um, as well as they could be. And this is another great session that's being um, uh, scheduled at CIC um, about how things like vaccine registries for COVID vaccine that were developed across Canada could potentially be leveraged to improve uh, surveillance for other routine vaccines. So in conclusion, I'll just highlight that the COVID-19 pandemic has really illustrated the importance of having a responsive, resilient immunization program, and that programs have to have the ability and capacity to withstand shocks and disruptions, quickly adapt to changing circumstances to maintain high coverage. The pandemic caused significant drops in routine vaccine coverage. Even though things like lockdowns have ended over a year ago, coverage remains below pandemic level, pre-pandemic levels. The pandemic also challenged everyone involved in public health to reimagine routine immunizations and to think creatively about ways to recover and improve. And that innovative mindset needs to remain. We need to continue to adapt and evolve routine immunization programs to meet community needs with the goal of ensuring that no one is left behind. So I'll just thank my, my team who helped me prepare for this and um, I look forward to some conversation. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much to both of our speakers. I thought it was interesting that there were similar messages that resonated in both presentations. Uh, we are going to open up the chat pod for questions. We have about 10 minutes and I am going to start us off uh, just referring back to the state of vaccine confidence and the findings in the UNICEF report and the findings that uh, Shannon, your research team has been working on. And I note that uh, for Canadian data in the UNICEF report, uh, confidence in uh, vaccines has decreased. So before the pandemic, um, the uh, proportion of the population that felt confident about vaccines was 91%. Now it's only 82% in Canada. And Shannon, that's a little bit different than what uh, your team and your collaborators have found. So I, I wanted to give you an opportunity to compare and contrast uh, the findings. Yeah, so that was one of the really interesting things as I looked at it and I compared the UNICEF report um, to what we'd found. And I think a lot of it speaks to um, the importance of context. So, um, and of course, as a as a scientist, I'm always looking at like, what were the what was the methodology, who was included in the study and whatnot. So a few differences we saw there are that um, the study um, referenced in the UNICEF report wasn't asked specifically of parents, it was um, the general public. So the question about um, vaccine confidence was was broader than just children. And then there was a specific question, though, about um, um, the importance of childhood vaccines, but again, asked of the general public. So although that's valuable, for sure, it's critical really to assess the perspective of the vaccine decision maker, because that's who's going to decide whether the child gets vaccinated. So looking at parents specifically would be an important next step. And, and that's in the in the smaller study that we did, we were looking specifically at parents. Um, and I think the other thing to, to keep in mind is that in the, in the um, study referenced in the report, it was asking broadly about vaccine confidence. So I suspect people were maybe uh, mixing together some COVID vaccine and routine vaccine issues there. So I think maybe that is maybe another distinction between um, the findings we had, which was specifically about routine vaccines. So it's not a criticism of either. It's just to say that when you see differences like that, you kind of need to dig in to see who was asked what question about what vaccines, and that'll really help shed some light. Thank you. I think that, thank you for that, that answer. I, I think it's important to uh, continue to do these surveys to see how things are progressing as, as we recover. I have a follow-up question for Ephraim also about uh, that figure. 
so you had said that 52 out of 55 countries had data suggesting that vaccine confidence had decreased. And the three countries where they had increased were China, India, and Mexico. And in China, the increase was close to 10%. It was hard to tell exactly from the figure. I was wondering if you have any hypotheses about what happened in those three countries to raise vaccine confidence. Uh, thanks, Sherry. That, that's a very useful question, and I wanted to start by explaining what vaccine confidence is. Um, what we have assessed in here is an individual's perception whether vaccines are important for children or not. And the respondents respond, they agree, they disagree, and the usual Likert scale of strongly agree and strongly disagree. But there is also other component of this assessment or survey that we have not analyzed, which is asking, what do people think about safety and effectiveness or efficacy of these vaccines? So you will need to compose both the efficacy and effectiveness versus uh, uh, the perception whether these are important or not. But the overall essence of vaccine confidence is a show of how much of a trust and uh, how much of confidence or belief that each individual has on the system. So um, when you see such a data, the first thing you would like to take is there is a warning sign that we have to take seriously. It's not even about actually the absolute numbers of decrease or increase. It's about what it means and how important vaccine confidence and how important building this trust on vaccines is going to be, especially when you have this significant number of children, about 67 million of them that we will need to catch up on you cannot afford to lose sight on these critical matters that really uh, are important in engaging. We cannot necessarily, I mean, we, we're not able to associate uh, what is happening in India, in China, or in Mexico uh, uh, to attribute it to a specific factor that increase the confidence. It's just a finding. And uh, the, the, the vaccine confidence project has been in place since 2015. So there are these yearly assessments that measure this. But we only took the 2019, which is right before the pandemic. We avoided the 2020 because there were so much confusions about it, given COVID-19 being discussed, et cetera. So there was quite high chatter, the likelihood of being biased is high, and we only took 2021. So we compared 2019 with 2021 by the way of showing maybe the pandemic had an impact in eroding a bit of vaccine confidence that we need to keep paying attention for childhood immunization. Hey. Thank you for that. Uh, question from the chat pod for Ephraim. The report underscores the need for governments to invest in immunization, primary health care, and the healthcare worker workforce. Have governments been receptive to these messages? These are not new messages. And this has been messages that have been resonating across different development um, sectors. Um, but it's good to see that. Um, there has been a significant erosion of government health expenditure in health and uh, investments in health during the pandemic, as so many countries have lost significant you know, an amount of their economic productivity. And growth have been very slow and in some countries a negative growth. So they had to reprioritize to different other sectors that they think is much more important. But what we have seen in 2020 and 2021 is a significant increase in the overall absolute number of dollars investment made in health because of the focus on responding to the pandemic and so on. And so on. But unfortunately, the focus has been solely on COVID-19 response and COVID-19 vaccination. It came at the expense of investments in health systems, et cetera. But what follows that is the likelihood of now, if you speak to governments, they will tell you, agriculture, education, and other economic sectors think now it's their, their turn to get more funding. So which could come at the expense of, again, immunization in primary health care. So it was important to remind governments that it is now time to make sure we continue putting more money within the health system. It has been received in many countries, but of course, the pie is small, especially in low and middle income countries, and it's always a negotiation between what to budget forward. Thank you for that answer. Uh, next question is, thank you for a great presentation. What happens to zero dose children as they get older? 
what is the chance that they catch up? And that's a, it's a really good question because it's interesting that the zero dose numbers are quite similar to the measles vaccine coverage for first dose numbers from UNICEF and WHO. They're, they're very, very similar. And since uh, measles containing vaccine is administered after DPT, it makes me think that often they're not caught up, but I would love to hear from you. Yes. And as I earlier stated, we now have 67 million under vaccinated and unvaccinated children. That we will need to catch up, a very important step. But the main challenge behind catching up on these children is the systemic challenge that many of these countries focus. Currently, WHO and UNICEF, Gavi, and a few other partners, we are working on developing a country catch up and recovery plan for the top 20 countries that have the largest number of zero dose children. This, the, these top 20 countries include the large countries, the likes of India, Nigeria, uh, Pakistan, Philippines, and across different regions. And the intention is to really support these countries do catch up interventions, which requires them to also expand. Many of these children who were missed in 2019 and 2020 are now older than two year old. And the usual challenge is you will not be able to caught up with them because the country policies do not permit uh, vaccinating older age children. So one of the negotiations is for countries to modify their policies. So many countries are now expanding the eligibility to up to five-year-old because they do it for campaigns such as measles, et cetera, to be able to be protected. So it's important that these zero-dose children, if we do not take an active uh, measure at this very moment, they will be lost from the systems, they will fall into the cracks, and they will be the ones who will be affected by several outbreaks and the likes of measles are going to be quite deadly. And that's why I actually started talking about all this with the measles case, which is the story of millions at this very moment. And that is why UNICEF is calling now, it is time that we act as governments, as global community to, for, to find ways of reaching these children. Thank you for that. And I note that was also the first uh, of your list of interventions in the last chapter of the report. It's doubling down and getting everybody caught up and everybody vaccinated and being aggressive and proactive about it, which I think is, a, is a, always an important message, but especially now. Uh, so I uh, want to thank our presenters uh, for their insight and for taking the time to speak with us uh, today. Um, we are always striving to improve our seminars and our events. Uh, prior to the presentation today, we sent out an evaluation survey by email, and we will be including the link to the evaluation uh, survey in the chat pod as well. The form is only a couple of questions. It should take you less than five minutes to fill out, but it would be really helpful uh, to provide us with feedback uh, so that we can improve our events. Um, Please don't forget to mark your calendars for our next webinar, which will be on May 10th with Dr. Sarah Buchan and Dr. Ramadeep Graywall, who will be joining us to discuss vaccine effectiveness, the basics and beyond. Uh, to register for upcoming events and to stay up to date about the latest happenings in the immunization world, uh, please make sure to sign up for a monthly digest and we've placed the sign up sheet in the chat as well. And thank you to our presenters and our attendees for joining us today. And we hope to see you at CVPD events in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Shannon. And thank you everyone for offering the opportunity to be able to speak on this important platform. And looking forward to continue the engagement. And if there are more questions, we'll be happy to provide some um, reflections. Virtually. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ephraim. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Care, everyone. Thank you, Shannon. Take care.